There you go. He'll get to where he'll just walk off instead of whirl and run. Notice he's harder to hold going to the right than he is the left. Needs a lot of work this way. Horse numbers in the United States are on the incline. Numbers are growing each year. What are the reasons for this growth? I don't know all of the reasons, but I do feel like that people are rediscovering horses and horse activities as a way to use their leisure time do feel like that more people are looking for opportunities to enjoy the out of doors. And of course, horses do provide this opportunity. Our first tape is directed towards owning your first horse, whether you have him now or you will have him in the near future. So, you've been thinking about purchasing a horse, either as an individual or as a family you've thought that this is the kind of an activity you'd like to get involved in, you'd like to have a horse, you'd like to learn to ride him, uh, and you'd like to enjoy horseback riding. Let's talk about if this is a decision you've made or something you're contemplating, some of the obligations that you as a horse owner would have to accept. And I mention all of these obligations not to discourage anyone, quite to the contrary. I would like to in encourage people to do this because I believe in horsemanship. I believe in what it can do for a family and I believe what it can do for the person. I think it's a wonderful activity. But it's been my experience that people who go into it with a great deal of knowledge and uh, uh, have looked at all the consequences and uh, are happier. They are not uh, surprised when they run into certain uh, problems that they did not know were going to exist. So if we're thinking about owning this horse, Let's think about our obligations, some considerations that we, need to that we need to think about. First of them is where are we going to keep our horse? How are we going to house him? And uh, that's a primary concern, I think, for everybody. Let's first and, uh, mention and consider public stables. They play such an integral part, such an important part in the horse industry in providing a place for people who live in town to keep their horse and as you look at public stables, see what's available in your area. How close are you to them? How often can you get to the barn to ride your horse? What kind of care can you get at this particular stable? All of these are important considerations. One of them that we'd really like to address is the people who have the small acreage, the suburbanite who would really like to uh, use their acreage in, in a way to enjoy horses. Now, it doesn't take a great deal of uh, acreage to uh, have a horse program and to be able to enjoy it. Certain restrictions where we live, we need to look at zoning regulations, we need to look at uh, restrictions, uh, building codes, and what we can have in certain areas. Most of our uh, suburban communities allow for, within reason, for you to keep a horse. Uh, if we're looking at uh, my place here and where we keep our horses, we are very comfortable here and can do the things we want to do with our home, with our horses, and other things that we need to enjoy them on less than four acres. So uh, a lot of people have that much land in suburbia. So if you want to take that land and utilize it uh, where you can enjoy horses, the first thing you want to consider is put you up a barn a safe place to keep your horse. When I say a safe place, uh, sometimes a pen is a safe place, but most of us sooner or later are going to want some shelter for the horse in addition to just good fencing. So if we talk about building a barn, this barn's been here 18, 19 years, uh, built by hand, uh, so to speak, and we just built it as we thought of it. I think if we had it to do over again, <clears throat> we certainly would not build this kind of barn particularly. Uh, we would probably look at modular barns, barns that are portable, that uh, you can move in and put up one stall, two stalls, can put a shed with it, you can add to it if you want to, 
aesthetically, uh, you can dress them up where they look good in your community and your neighborhood and are pleasing to your neighbors as well as yourself. Uh, those kinds of buildings also uh, have the portable aspect of them is good. If you move, you may want to take your barn down and take it with you. Or if you decide to, uh, uh, that you want to sell it, it has value and you can dismantle it and someone else will buy it. So the things that you look at in a barn, and we look at this barn here built out of, and the, the, bar, the stalls you'll buy, the barns you'll buy, you must remember that horses love wood. So the wood that we've put up in here is all treated lumber, treated lumber. It's been here many years and horses have not chewed on it. They will not eat it. Uh, so that's a must. The other things is the size of your stalls and the, the other kinds of uh, things that you want to put with it. So everybody will design, I think they're born uh, to fit them and I would suggest to everybody start very modest. Start with something that meets your needs now and uh, if you ever want to expand, well you can. In addition to the barn, you've got to think about the other, the housing, you've got to think the other aspects of horse ownership. I see a lot of old horseshoes laying right here, hanging right here on the fence in front of me which reminds us that horses' feet have to have care. We don't have to have them all shot. A lot of horses can get along barefooted, as we say. But even if they are not shod, their feet are more than likely going to have to be trimmed because we're not going to ride them on any kind of a surface that would keep them worn off to a natural length. So uh, they're going to have to be taken care of. So you need to think about foot care, whether it be shod or unshod, and uh, that's something that we all have to accept. The other thing we've got to accept, I guess, is how to feed him and learn how to feed him and how to take care of him. Uh, real simply, I'm going to walk down here and what I have pulled out is for mature horses, which is what everybody should have, a mature, just a light working horse. I pulled out one day, one feeding for this horse and we're going to talk about it. Everybody's probably going to need a grain mixture in this bucket right here or two of these number three coffee cans. We've talked a lot of times about trying to tell people to feed their horses by pounds. We all need to feed by pounds, not, not measure because concentrated feeds weigh less and we can overfeed or underfeed. But we have weighed this can enough times on a set of scales that we know it weighs about three pounds. So I've got two of them in here for a horse. I'm feeding him six pounds this morning. I'll feed him six pounds tonight of grain and that's going to keep him in good flesh. Some easy keepers, I have one horse in this barn that I've got that feed cut down on. He's an easy keeper. If we don't ride him much, he gets too fat. So we've got about a third of that cut out for him. But that's a rule of thumb. That's a place for us to get started. Is about uh, uh, 12 pounds of feed a day or, or a minimum of 10, according to how much we work him. Now the horse is going to need some roughage. I want to pick up some hay over here. He's gonna, he's gonna need some roughage to keep his digestive system healthy. And a lot of times chewing on this roughage is what keeps him from chewing on the fence. Many times horses chewing on the fence and doing those things do them out of boredom. It's not necessarily a nutritional deficiency. They do it, do it out of boredom. Over here in my right hand is some real high quality alfalfa hay. Very leafy. And if I feed this as a hay for my horse, I have to cut that grain down because the energy is real high in this, plus it's high in protein, and if I feed that, I, it takes less grain. On the other hand, I have over here uh, uh, a grass hay. This happens to be coastal Bermuda grass, but it could be any of our grass hays. Energy density per pound is less, and it pretty well fits with the 10 to 12 pounds of grain. So you can take this, 10 or 12 pounds of grain, twice a day, and you're gonna get along. That's a block of hay, and everybody says, what does it weigh? Well, it's interesting. What if it weighs the wrong amount? We're going to feed our horses by a block. And I keep talking to hay balers about what to make it weigh. You know, I'd like for it to weigh about three or four pounds. And I like giving that twice a day. But sometimes they don't weigh that. But we're not going to go tear a block in half and feed it to a horse. So realistically, we're going to feed him by the block. That's the way we're going to buy hay. That's the way the hay balers put it up. And if this is a little bit light, I may have to increase my grain or vice versa. So if we think in terms we got to have grain and hay, 
And that's simply right there is all that a horse needs that is a mature horse that's been worked lightly. If we work him harder, we just increase the grain. If we work him less and he goes to getting fat, we cut the grain back. So we see both extremes. I see horses that are probably too thin, they don't feel real good. I see horses that are too fat to work and they don't feel real good. So I think that'll help us understand. You Most of the time, if you can buy this hay, uh, if you do develop where you've got your barn and you can buy this hay when people are cutting hay and get it in the field, you can save some money. If you've got one horse, it may not be worth it. You can go to the feed store and buy this hay as you need it and you need very little storage. You can buy uh, 50 pound bags of horse feed that'll come in paper bags that are easy to get rid of. Mama can pick one up while she's shopping for groceries. And so with one horse, it's not that much problem. And uh, if you get into more horses, Everybody will work that out, I think, as they go. Okay, feeding the horse, got to accept that. That's a responsibility. If we got him in a public stable, we're gonna pay for that. Probably somebody else is gonna do it. Or we may have him in a stable where we board him, we, we house him only and we do the feeding. Or we may be in there where the, the stable manager does the feeding maybe once a day, sometimes twice a day. So in addition to then housing, we've got to talk about feed, we've got to talk about uh, taking care of his feet. We're going to also have to talk about taking care of the internal parasites that are in him. We're going to have to get on a wor worming program. Some of that you can do to yourself, some of it you're going to need a veterinarian to help you, but you just need to be aware that that's what's going to have to be done. There's certain health, other aspects of health that I wouldn't want to just pass over an immunization program again that uh, you may need your veterinarian to help you work out a good immunization program where that you feel like uh, your horse is uh, not going to catch any contagious diseases. Uh, you can relate living with your horse a lot like living with your dog. You run into these same things, feeding the dog, vaccinating the dog, keeping the parasites out of the dog. So it's not a great deal different with a horse. The other thing is you get into these suburbanite surroundings here and as you try to uh, live with your horse so to speak a few things that we do here that'll help you one of them you're going to have to figure out what you're going to do with the manure now if you can pan right down to the end here you see we've got a little trailer sets down here and we clean these stalls at least once a day and we dump manure in that trailer and from that trailer we let it stay in there and let like for it to get hot we would like for the manure and any, anything else, extra hay that's picked up in there, <clears throat> we'd like for it to get hot over, stay in there for a week, 10 days, and then we go right out over the grass and spread it. We do most hours around here by hand. We've got a little tractor we use. You can hook onto that with your pickup. You can get along good. But it's nice for us suburbanites that there's some people making some little bitty, uh, little smaller manure spreaders that you could park here, that you can pull with uh, small equipment that you could run out and scatter this manure and wouldn't have to do it by hand. But we do it a lot by hand and by composting this stuff, letting it get hot, you hopefully kill weed uh, seeds that are in it and you won't scatter weed seeds out over your grass because you hopefully it gets too hot in there and you kill them. Plus the fact that if it gets hot, we kill uh, larvae of parasites that are in there and we throw it out over the ground and spread it out and let the sun shine on it. And if our horse grazes over it then, we don't feel like we're reinfesting him that much. Plus it does do a lot to the soil, does do a lot to plant life and does help. So that's one good way you've got to figure some way you're gonna take care of it. That's the way we do it here. The other thing that'll be a real problem for you, particularly in the summertime, is flies. You've got to approach the fly problem realistically uh, it's been my observation it's getting harder and harder to, to uh, buy fly sprays that have much resid residual to them. So what you have to do is stay right after them daily. There are very nice elaborate fogging systems that you can put in your barn that you can buy them. You'll have a whole tank full of insecticides uh, uh, over here and that on a timer at a very regular intervals you'll get a small mist go through your barn and the flies will be nothing. And those things work real good. There's a few mechanical problems related to them and sometimes they're expensive. But as we just getting started, you can do this by hand. You can do it by hand. I have a little sprayer here <coughs> that you can buy at any, anybody's feed store and you can just pump this sprayer up. We put the right kind of load it up with the right insecticide, pump it up, and we go through this barn twice a day. 
spray the walls, we spray the stalls, and we spray everywhere to try to get through. And we certainly got to spray that manure trailer down there twice a day. Sometimes in the summertime, <clears throat> we may have to do that three times a day to keep them out. There's another little apparatus that'll help you, and we've used them in these stalls here, and they work real good. If you'll kind of stay on top of them, there's a little battery-powered sprayer that you can put in your stall, and that every 15 minutes, it will release a little bit of fly killer. Those I, I would recommend also for people with one or two stalls. Those things are worthwhile, and they keep the flies down. You gotta realize you got neighbors, they don't want flies, of course, where we are here, our house is closer to the barn than our neighbors are, and we don't want flies at our house. So it behooves us all, I think, to try to stay after the fly problem and try to keep the fly problem to a very minimum. So if you look at that and the other things that are in here, a big lot of it is stuff that you accumulate over a period of time. I think I've said many times that if we, all of us, stopped and counted up what we have invested with our horse now, it might discourage us from ever getting into the, to the horse business, so to speak. But on the other hand, we don't need all that to get started. I've given you the bare minimum, that's all we need. We need a saddle, we need a bridle, and you know, we need a brush, and we're started. Now the things you see around here in our barn are things that we've accumulated over 18, 20 years, and a lot of this equipment never wears out. There's one thing to remember about it, if you take care of it, it never wears out. So here you see lots of bridles hanging here and halters on a couple of racks where they're handy for us. These are just little things and we used to keep all of our saddles in the barn and we got to where we thought that was too unhandy, so now we just put racks out here under the shed row and keep the saddles right there, keep racks around for our halters and our bridles and all of this you accumulate over a period of time. One other little aspect that will help anybody, uh, I think whether you got one stall or two stalls or three or four. We built this barn right here. I, never, I didn't need but two stalls. We used them for years. The other two stalls up here was used for storage. We kept equipment in them, uh, anything else we want to keep in them. And as we grew, we completed the stalls. And we've got another stall here behind the barn and another one up here now as we begin to grow and we want these, but in the beginning had two stalls. But one thing that will help us all, particularly as we try to go into the winter time, we'd like to keep our horses slick. You see lights burning over all of these stalls here. Right up in the corner of this barn is a little timer that I think I give $16 for, and you can buy them for five or six dollars that'll go in your house that fits on one lamp. One lamp. You can take one of them and put it on one stall, or you can get one like I've got in the hole that fits into my main power supply coming in here, and that's set to, to provide 16 hours of daylight for these horses and eight hours of darkness. They, they stay on 16 hours of daylight, eight hours of darkness, 12 months out of the year. The horses never hair up, never make winter hair. So if we want to show or ride a horse right out of this barn in the wintertime, we don't have to keep a lot of blankets packed on him and a lot of hoods on him to keep him slick. Of course, a lot of times we'll turn these off. Sometimes we want a her horse to hair up. We would like for him to make a winter hair. Sometimes the horse's tail gets a little short. And you say, the only way we're going, we're going to have to let that hair grow. So sometimes we'll kick a horse outside, we want him to hair up. But in cases, that's what the, why these lights are on. Make sure that these horses the, get 16 hours of daylight. So you got to realize that light that he receives through his eye, sending the message to the master gland, the pituitary gland, is what dictates length of hair much more than temperature. We, I think, all operated for years under the conception that if it got cold, we made hair and so forth. It's length of day that's much more important, and we can fool this horse. We make this horse think that June 22nd, which is the longest day of the year, that it's June 22nd all year round. So he stays right on that longest day of the year all year round, and he never really makes any hair. So that's a, a, a kind of little management tool that helps. They don't necessarily have to be on during the daytime, but my barn doesn't have a lot of light in it. It's easy for me to just let them burn all day. They come on at seven in the morning, go off at 11 at night. Now in the summertime, we run these fans on each stall. Fans hooked on the same power supply. 
Fan comes on at 7 in the morning right with the lights. Goes off at 11 at night. It's usually cool enough by then that a horse doesn't need the, need the fan. So all of that is a little techniques that you can work together, but the timer is a, is a good, good concept. The other things we need to think about, I guess, as far as just get us in to how we're going to play with this horse. We've got us a barn. We know where we're going to get our feed. Uh, we uh, we kind of know that where somebody is that'll help us take care of his feet. Uh, maybe my same veterinarian that I've been using for other small animals, or at least there's a large animal veterinarian around that's going to help me a little bit with my immunization program and my parasite program. Next thing we need to realize that's being an investment <coughs> is to buy a trailer. We're going invariably, if we buy a horse, we've got to take him home, and you're going to find that you're going to need a trailer uh, sooner or later. You may think, no, I don't need this now. The man will deliver the horse, and I'm going to leave him right here at this stable. That's fine if you think you can get along with that kind of an operation. But sooner or later, I think you're going to want a trailer. Uh, again, I recommend on trailers that... Uh, a lot like uh, a lot of other stuff. Look around, buy you a good used trailer. Good used trailer. It's two things that if you take care of them, the people who make them tell me that if we took care of them, they'd nearly go out of business. Two things, uh, saddles and trailers. If you take care of them, they don't wear out. Now, we either mistreat them and let them wear out, don't try to maintain them, or we just get tired of that style. We want something different. So not any question what those two things, what really keeps the trailer industry and the saddle business going. And I'm not any different than the rest of them. From time to time, I want a different trailer and I may try to make a trade or a saddle. But realize you're making an investment. I've made this recommendation to a lot of people and seen them go out and give four to five, maybe six, seven hundred dollars for a nice used trailer that is very good for them then and they'd pull it a couple of years and want to sell it and get every penny back that they give for it. So those are nice investments that uh, we can do and it may cost a little more than that now. I'm just using those figures. I haven't bought a used trailer lately, but uh, those are good. Uh, when you go to talking about trailers, keep a good floor in it and keep the, the bearings and keep the wheel bearings grease good on it. If you do that, what else is there about a trailer to wear out if you take care of it? and don't let rust eat it up. So if you take care of the trailer, take care of the, from time to time, repack the wheel bearings on it and keep a good floor in it. Check that floor from time to time. We could spend days here on trailer safety, but that's the big thing. Check that floor in it, make sure it hadn't rotted and uh, make sure you've got some good brakes on it and some good lights on it and you can get all of that done and don't have to spend uh, that much money to get started. So if we do those things now, We've accepted all them, we talk about them, so yeah, we can handle that. Uh, we'd still, you know, you haven't scared us off, and appreciate you mentioning it to us that these are things we need to do. We'd like to get us a horse, and uh, uh, we're making arrangements for all these other things right now, and we'd like to get us a horse and get started. Now, word of precaution right here. We're gonna be making a lot of these tapes, and regardless of what horse you start with, if you keep looking at these tapes, I think we can help you get along with the horse you've got. And I think we can help you improve the horse you've got to where it's satisfactory for you. If you don't buy too big a mistake to start with. As an old saying goes, you can't make a rose out of a sow's ear. So don't buy too big of a mistake to start with. I, I, I don't think anybody ought to buy the ultimate in their first horse. I think they ought to buy a horse that has a lot of characteristics about it that would be good for a person to learn to ride the horse, learn to live with him, learn to take care of him, and the bottom line in all that is safe. He needs to be a good, safe, gentle horse. He doesn't have to be the most brilliant horse in the world to go do a lot of things with, but he needs to be a safe horse, and I'm going to get some horses out here in a minute, and we're going to talk about what is a safe horse, uh, what would be a good horse for that first horse. How do you go about checking him out? What do you want on him? You do this when you go buy a car. Even if you buy a used car, you go check it out. You check the brakes on it, you drive it, you listen to the motor, you see if you can turn it left and right, can you back it up, uh, and all of these kinds of things. We need to do the same things when we get ready to buy this horse. What I'm gonna do is go back in the stall here and bring out a nice, pretty, 
slick yearling, young yearling gelding. He's pretty, and he's the kind that would uh, set every little girl's heart to throbbing, and that this is exactly what I'd have to have. Now you go off looking for your horse. <clears throat> Somebody lead you out something about like this. So boy, I think that's nice. Isn't he pretty? Isn't he nice? Let me bring him down here and kind of turn him around. Well, he is pretty. So kind of get him set here where you can look at him on camera. He is pretty. He's nice. He's a yearling. He's going to be ready to ride this winter. And he's nice and he'll impress you. You go look. His hair is slick. He's pretty. If you know anything about confirmation, you know he's a nice horse. Would this be a nice horse for you? Is a person going to say, this would be a good horse. I think you ought to buy him. Boy, you can get acquainted with him this winter. You can go to riding him, and you and him can grow up together, so to speak. I hear people say this a lot with their kids. And you can grow up together. Is that a good philosophy? No. Very bad. Very bad. This horse is going to take a lot of skill to get this horse broke, and it's not the kind of thing a person that's trying to get started riding horses needs to get involved in. So let's don't get... Let's don't get fooled with something that's slick and pretty and it's young and this philosophy of letting us grow up together. Don't think that's going to work that good for us. Uh, run into too many people that's got problems. Regardless how gentle they are, how nice they are, as we say in the terminology, he's still dumb. And he'll be dumb until he gets a little age on him and can be ridden a while. So that's not a good philosophy. Let's talk about some additional facilities that uh, you might want around your place. Plus, let's take a look at some other horses that might be appropriate for your first horse. Uh, again, uh, we apologize for as we pan across the area here that it is not any greener than it is. Ordinarily, that's green grass and looks nice. We've caught it in a drought here and it's really dry while we're doing this filming. Now I'm going to go around here at another one of the stalls. <clears throat> we're going to catch another horse out. And we're going to catch her and bring her out here. And I might say a little bit more as I bring her out. What are the things you want around your place in addition to the barn? We're going to pan around here in a minute and you're going to see that we're in sub <coughs> a suburban area here. It's not 75 yards over to my neighbor's backyard. I guess not much over 50. And uh, I've got neighbors all around me here, and they have a dog maybe if they don't have any horses. The other things you need, I think, as we pan around is to take a look at, I have a big round pen here, and uh, you're going to want that. And I'm going to get this mare out here and, and uh, ride her in the round pen. Let's talk about whether she'd be what you'd want for your first horse. All right, I've brought a mare out here we're going to take a look at. You notice that as much as I've talked about flies, there's still some flies flying around in here. And another reason why you'll want to get rid of the flies. Flies are irritating to the horse and you can't train them that well. Let's talk about some of the attributes of a horse you might want to buy. First thing, I'd like to have a horse I can tie up. I hate to see one that every time I tie him, he breaks whatever I tie him to. So it's a real simple thing. And I mentioned the trailer. There's nothing any more frustrating than have a horse you can't tie up or you can't haul that the, you have trouble getting him in a trailer or he is a scrambler, he has a lot of trouble. So make sure when you go to buy the horse, does he trailer well? And uh, make sure that he'll tie up. Now, what I'm going to do right here is I, this mare, I got her out here for us to ride a little bit and look at, even just for personal pride. She's not going anywhere. There's her old bridal pass grown out here over the process of us riding her here at the house. And I'm just going to trim it here for you just to make one other point. At first place, it'll make me feel a little better if I have to ride her and look at her if I don't have that hair sticking up. The point I'm wanting to make, though, how hard is your horse that you're going to buy to trim? And you say, well, I don't want to trim him. Sooner or later, you're going to want to for nothing else, just to satisfy yourself that he'll look better. You see somebody with one trim, you say, I'd like to do that. Well, you know, any woman, child, or anybody can trim this mare. And now I'm through. That's all the time it took me just to cut her bridle path out. It may not be a show quality job. I'm not particularly interested in that. I'm just interested in this mare looking better so that I'm not embarrassed when I ride her around. So I know of people who have 
who have <clears throat> not bought horses because they knew they were real hard to trim. And sometimes they just hard to do. So that's a good example. And you can put these clippers around this mare and it doesn't bother if I want to trim her head up a little more or whatever. Well, it doesn't bother. She's had some of it. If I want to trim the hair off her nose, I can do it. And anybody that's a novice and getting started don't have a big problem. Miss Murray hadn't tried to pull the clippers out of my hands. She hadn't had to break loose and run off, okay? So I think that's a good point. And I feel better just getting that bridle path cut. I think that's a good point that a horse that trim, a horse that's nice to work around, a horse that you can brush on, and a horse that is just a nice horse to be around, and you haven't even saddled him. But he needs to be a nice horse to get around. You can walk around this horse, you can brush on him, you can do what you want to if you want to pick feet up and clean them out. The horse is not wild, he's not, not a bronc, not, not foolish about a lot of those things. So look for that. And as I'm talking right here, we, we can make a whole tape on horse safety. Well, one of the things that's important that I find people just starting with a horse is they want to handle their horse right here. Oh, I hope he don't step on me. Oh, I hope he doesn't hurt me. I've got a horse in the far end down there that's been a twice world's champion and uh, belongs to a, a young lady, a girl, and her mother to this day, and they've led that horse for eight years now, or six years, her mother's still afraid he's gonna step on her foot. So you gotta get used to being around a horse, and of course that horse won't step on your foot. He's a nice, gentle horse, really great horse, but he still bothers mother because he's a big horse. Now, size may have something to do with it, but I'd buy a smaller horse or a bigger horse if I'd get all of these attributes in it. Let me continue about walk, getting around the horse. If I walk around behind this horse, I should either walk up close to him, I hope you can see this angle, right up close to him, or I should get completely back away from him. Right here, just a nice distance. I'll move this mare around in a minute. That's just a nice distance to get kicked. Ooh. And if I put my hand on this mare's hip as I walk around her, if she moves, picks up a foot or anything, I feel it, she telegraphed it to me, and if I need to get away from her, I push. And I'm away from her. So I'd rather be up close. If she kicks me, she does not get a real good good angle at me. If I'm off out here about three feet, she can really hurt me. But if I'm up in here close and she moves or she tries to kick, so why well, I'm, I'm safer up here. So either be up here, have your hand on your horse, talk to your horse. When you walk around him, let him know. That tells him where you are. You have not surprised him. And that's better than being off out here. Whoa now, whoa now, easy now. Just the right distance to get hurt and it's scaring to the horse. This is reassuring to him. He knows where you are. He's gonna feel comfortable and knows what you're doing. Okay, now I'm gonna saddle a horse and all of these, if I'm looking for a horse to buy, I'd like to see this done. I'd like to see this horse brought right out of the stall, out of the pasture, whatever, caught, trimmed, whatever. And I would like to see the horse saddled and ridden right out so I know what I've got. Okay, before I put this saddle on this horse, a little thought right here. You notice I've got my cinch thrown up over the saddle. Now some people would even go so far as to throw their stirrup over. Put their stirrup up like this before they put it on the horse. I never do that because I'm stout enough just to set this saddle on top of this horse. But all of us ought to get our cinches up, all right? Now, <clears throat> put that pad on this mare and see if this bothers her, see if she's quiet, see if how long is it going to take me to get a saddle on her? Is she going to be still? Outside of fighting flies, well, this mare's not bothering anything. All right, I've got the saddle pad kind of like I want. Go back, I've got my cinches up on my saddle. Walk up to my horse, I may move her a little. I want to move her over a little so you can get a little better angle. Whoa, right there. Now, I can just, I'll swing that stirrup a little, but I don't drop it. I just set it on there, reach over if you have to with that hand, push it off. Now, I don't care how many Western movies you've seen, how they do it in the movies. To get this horse saddled right takes me a little, little time. I never just push that cinch off. Walk around here, take hold of it, and let it come down. Make sure all of your equipment works right. Look for faulty cinches. Look for 
uh, for rot in your leather. Make sure that it's all good every time you put the saddle on your horse. Now it takes me that long to adjust the saddle. You don't just throw it up on him. I make sure nothing's folded under. It fits right and I like it. And a lot of times I will walk to the offside of this horse maybe twice before I am satisfied that that saddle suits me and I've got everything lined out like I want. Now then, as you reach your hand down under to get that cinch, make sure that the place you're going to pull that cinch up on doesn't have a grass burr in it or nothing in it. Be best if you reach with your right hand. Run your hand down, rub that place where you're going to pull it up. Nothing on there. Then reach and get the cinch and pull it on up. So all of those things I think so many of us do self, uh, subconsciously and uh, we do it every time we saddle a horse. Now I'm going to watch this horse as I pull the cinch up on her. I'm going to see how she's going to react to it. Not a very big horse, but I think these cinches are pretty well adjusted to fit this horse. Now, I've got enough loops around there, now I'm ready to pull. Pull and snug, and then quit. Hunt a hole right there, and I'm going to quit. Why? I'm not going to pull this horse as hard as I can pull him, or that I would like to have it, that I'm going to ride him with. Now get your back cinch. Back cinch if you got one on your saddle. Pull it up just snug as better. Now, I don't have that mare real tight. And there's a reason for it. I see people that just pull their horse the way they're going to ride them, right here, and never tighten it again. I'd like to move this mare around. Fact of business, if you can catch me now, I'd like to just take her to the round pen right, out, right outside the barn here. Just take a minute and walk her over there. That's where I'm going to ride her. And we're going to look at her now. Everything to date has been good. She led right out. She's not hard to saddle. She wasn't, uh, she seemed to be nice enough. We uh, didn't see any bad habits. She sure don't like flies any better than I do, but I can't hold that against her or any of the rest of them. Now, I've led this mare a little distance now. Now what I ought to do is to pull this saddle up a little tighter on this mare. I'll just put, get me another hole, all right? Because what horses will learn to do is swell if you pull them all at one time. They swell up on you, and then after you walk them, or if you just get on him and ride off, you won't ride uh, 50, 50 yards till your cinch is loose, because then the horse lets down. So be fair with the horse and let the horse kind of get started that way, okay? Ooh. Now I've led this mare around enough, and that's critical. I don't expect any horse to pull him as tight as I want him right there at that barn and never mount him under the barn. Lead him out from under the barn, step on him, and lope off without having some problems. That's not fair to the horse. We have some that will. There's a couple in that barn that will, but we still don't handle them that way. There's a lot of them that you get a misreading if you try to do that. You say, well, this horse is bronchy, this horse is wild, where if you'd given him a chance, he really isn't, okay? And this is the kind of chance I'm talking about. Now, I'm gonna hook a running martingale on this horse, and I'm checking this horse out, and we'll talk about it in later, in later tapes. But I'm checking this horse out with a snaffle bit, the mildest bit I can put in his mouth. I'm gonna put a little running martingale on. Now, I've given this horse a chance to be broke, now I'm going to get on him. Now you're getting on a strange horse. Try to gather your reins up tight enough that your horse can't go anywhere. So I like to get them tight and put them right there in that hand, right on his neck, so that I can pick up on them and stop the horse or do anything I want to. It wouldn't be any different if you was trying to get on a, if you was trying to get in a car. I keep drawing that parallel. I want her to get sideways here where we can see how I've got my hand gathered up. If I thought she was a real bronc, I, I really don't want to go into that. There's a lot tougher ways to cheek this horse up and get on him the first time. But I'm assuming I'm buying a broke horse, okay? I get him gathered up, put my foot in that stirrup, and I want to see if this horse will stand still. Pony Express has gone out as far as I'm concerned. I want these horses to stand still while I get on. 
and I'll train my horse to do that. As I step up right here, I'll have my hand in that mane, and I'll steady myself and pull right here, but I can get his mouth with one hand. Ooh. Now don't let the horse walk off. He's yours or any others. Let him sit there a minute. You get up here and get all everything fixed. Get your feet in the stirrups right. Get your hands on the reins right. Now you're ready to untrack him. See what you got. And I'm, we're looking at this horse. Everything we've seen so far is all right. Well, he walks all right. Now I'm going to see how the turning is. I'm just going to pull right here. Well, that's all right. Yeah, I can stir him around. Came this way. Came this way. Check that out. You know, see if I can turn him. Whoa, see if I can stop him. Oh, he can stop him. Yeah. See if I can back him. Oh yeah, back's pretty good on that mild bit. Okay, I checked him out there. See if he's got a little neck rein. Kind of turn my hand sideways and see if I can neck rein him a little bit. Get over, pretty nice. Now I'm just gonna check the gates out on the horse. Let's just trot the horse and see what we got. What I trot a horse for is for softness. I trot this mare and she's soft enough. And I won't turn her head wide loose yet. I'll see what I've got. And as I put a little pressure on her head, I'm trying to determine, did that make her mad? Me to try to guide her somewhere? Did she pitch her head? Did she fight her head? What are these things you look for? I'm not asking them to be great. I'm just asking them to walk, trot, and lope, and stop, and back up for me and be a nice horse to ride. That's all I want. I'd say, well, that trot's all right. Sure trot's all right. Pulled back to a walk, didn't get upset. Kind of knows how to turn around a little bit. Let's see if he's... See if he's one directional. Let's see if he'll go to the right. And realizing that the first time you ride him, you're gonna be a little coarse on what the horse is used to. So have a little patience. Oh, okay. You know, everything we've had so far is all right. Now I'm gonna do some other things to the horse right over here. I'm just gonna pull on his head and see if he'll turn around. Pretty nice. Pull right here and see if we can turn around. Pretty nice. Now I'm just gonna go right on and lope the horse. See if he lopes out. Oh, that tickled me. Loped out of there nice and quiet and the horse is fresh. Somebody hadn't rode this horse two hours before I got here. I'm, I hopefully I'm seeing the horse just natural, just like he is. And I say, boy, I'd like that. I can ride that horse all day, see? And you know, I uh, got to have faith in the person I'm buying from that the horse don't have a lot of drugs in him and I'm getting him natural, honest. I'm gonna see if he'll stop. Ooh. That kind of impressed me. My horse stopped and I never picked up on her head. I just slid my feet out and said, whoa, and she stopped. Boy, she loped good that way. Let's see if she can lope this way. Missed the lead. So, oh, I don't. right now, you may not even know that she missed it, but I did. But she corrected real nice. Come along here and loped along here, nice and quiet. Looks like they well, ain't about him right here. She said, doesn't seem to be upset very much. I'll get around over here again where I'm on the camera again, and I'm gonna ask this mare to stop again. Ooh. Didn't have to pull on her much, did it? Turn around here pretty nice. Ooh. Pick up on her head, she really does wanna stop. Turn around, okay. I'm kinda impressed. This horse might be a horse that'd do for me. I'm gonna see if the horse can just turn around a little bit, back up a little. 
Well, that don't impress me that much, but that's not that bad. Now that's not a hard spinning horse, but I can turn him around. And you know, I've done a lot of times with horses, and I, I don't guess I'd recommend it with everybody, but I've kind of spanked the horse a little bit. Disciplined him a little bit and see what kind of attitude he had about that. A horse that'll take a little spanking and get better is a horse I'd like to have. A horse that if I spank him a little bit, it blows his mind, he loses all concentration, he's gonna cause me a lot of trouble. So I may just get after this horse a little bit, speed her up a little bit, and I may spank her and, and, and bang on her a little and see what happens. Sure hate to, the horse sure doing nice, right? No need to do that, you say, okay. Well, it might be. Ooh. Ask her to lope right out of that. See what, see what rushing her little bit does to her. Ooh. Don't seem to upset her too much. When I'm turning her, I'm a bumping on her and going right on. Let me see if she can lope a circle off of this rail. That kind of impressed me right there. I could just turn her around a little bit and lope right off. Ooh. Sure can stop. Sure does want to stop good. Don't turn around real good, but a little bit. Now, what's the bottom line? Is this a, is it, would this make you a nice first horse? Would it, really? Have we found any bad holes in her? Well, let me tell you why she would not. No, you don't want this mare. You don't want this mare because she's a two-year-old. She's about 26 months old. And all this good behavior in here is what I've just taught her the last two or three months. It's not on her very deep. She hasn't been good a long time. And she's not old enough and seasoned enough. And you watch the way I handled her. I made her look pretty good. You put a greener person on her, she will not perform that good. But the big reason, you want all those attributes in a horse, but you want an older horse. A horse that's been good over a longer period of time, and that as you get on him and don't understand exactly what to do, he's gonna be good longer for you, be good longer while you're picking up the skills you need, and the horse will just tolerate you and go on. This mare wouldn't tolerate you long because she's too young. So I hope we've made a point here. Not only do we see in this horse the attributes and the things we'd like just to have a nice horse, but we're also seeing a horse that is too young, all the good behavior that she has, she has just had for two or three months, if we could put it that way. See, I don't mind spanking her a little, and I know she won't blow up, but she still would not be what that we'd want for you to have for your first horse basically too young so you'd like to have a horse that come do all these things that you could check out and he was right but he's oh what five six and don't run backwards if somebody offers your horse 14 15 years old if he seems to still be sound and going good may be the best investment you ever made so if we do all those things i think we if we buy the right horse buy a horse that as I said, he doesn't have to be brilliant, but you don't want a lot of bad habits in him. It's going to be hard to get out. And if he's just kind of a horse that floats along in neutral and doesn't have any bad habits, will let you acquire some skill and enjoy riding him a while. And then he should be a horse that maybe has got a little potential to get better as you want to spend more time with him and you learn a little more about what you're doing. All those things, and I think everybody then can start somewhere as a horseman and grow and go just as high as they want to and do as much as they want to with horses at their own speed. As I look back over this tape and try to think of those recommendations that we may have given you to get started in the horse business and to buy your first horse and get a place fixed to keep him, 
There's a couple of things that come to mind that possibly need to be explained and clarified some. Number one, at the time we we're making this tape, we've already alluded to the fact that it was really dry and the grass was brown. Seems that the flies were extremely heavy. And in this tape, throughout this tape, there were more flies than we, any of us would like to uh, have had. Uh, I didn't mention it, but nice little uh, smaller sprayers of insecticides that you apply directly to the horses before you ride him and during the riding will really be useful. Most of us do not feel like in the summertime during fly season that we can ride our horse and uh, uh, enjoy him a great deal if this horse is fighting flies. So that's kind of the, the right after saddling, the next thing we do is put on some fly spray. But in, in reference to that barn, two days after making this tape with concentrated spray-ins of three times a day, the flies were practically gone. So we caught them at when they were really heavy, not or, ordinarily they are not that heavy. So. Uh, Two days later, we were rid of the flies. Uh, we did change insecticides, and you may need to do that from time to time, thinking that the flies that are there may have a resistance, may have developed a resistance to the particular insecticide we're, we're using. So flies in, in fly time in the summertime can be a problem. The other thing that I may have passed over a little bit lighter than I intended to, and that was the feeding of the horse, where we talked about grain versus hay and I tried to show you one day's ration for a horse. Now keep in mind that ordinarily we, when we think about maintaining mature horses, that we think about him having 1% of his body weight in grain per day and 1% of his body weight in hay per day. So if he weighs 1,000 pounds, that's 10 pounds of grain, 10 pounds of hay. Those are only rule of thumbs, only a place to get started. The things that will vary them is the quality of hay that you have, how much you're riding the horse, and what condition do you really want him in. And if you really, the, probably the one you're going to alter most of the time is the grain. If you've got a real high quality, good hay, and you're not really using the horse hardly at all, very light work, he may maintain himself and be in good shape on hay alone. On the other hand, uh, if you're riding him hard and you, uh, your hay quality you feel like is a little bit low, uh, you're going to have to add some grain to it. And basically, the grain that we add is, a, is the amount that it takes to put the condition on the horse that we want. Uh, hay, a small amount of hay in a horse's gut we think is a good factor, a uh, good health factor, good management factor, seems to keep the horse healthy, uh, seems to keep him uh, psychologically happier if he's got a little uh, long hay to uh, chew on during the day. So you can adjust that grain up and down as you go about riding your horse. Now you know really, you, as we said in the tape, you're going to feed hay by the block. And whatever it weighs, if it's a little bit light, you'll feed a little more grain with it. If it's a good heavy block, you'll feed a little less grain. So you can vary your grain easier than you can vary the amount of hay that you're going to feed the horse. Go ahead and try to train him off his lodge line is you may need to work him sometime and don't have the round pen. And if he knows how to work off the lodge line, you can work him anywhere. So even though we could make him get his work out on that rail, we'll go ahead and train him off the lodge line too. So we have both. Do you see how horses get left-handed and right-handed? You handle them all the time from the left side. See, this horse is stiffer this way than he is.